Mason Crosby kicks it deep. Isaiah McKenzie, not going to catch that one. We got a touchback to start some Sunday night football, but it's time for us to take a look at the good, the bad, and the box score. Uh, or pass completion. Here's Lamar on a run. We're back. All right. Welcome to another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Box Score. I am your host, Justin J. Will underscore FF here with Wyatt B underscore FF. Wyatt, how is your Sunday going? Pretty good. Compared to last week, this is a way better Sunday. Last week was Week of the Reaper, injuries nonstop. This week, we got a bunch of exciting games, a lot of scoring. A good day for fantasy. Yeah, happy Halloween to you as well. Do you know what that means, the Halloween time of year? It means it's someone's birthday. Happy belated birthday <laughs> to you as well. Do you get to do anything extra fun for the birthday? Trick-or-treating. I mean, yeah, it was a good time. life now, but trick-or-treating is great. I mean, yeah. like circling back into this age where the kids go trick-or-treating and I get to do it too is just absolutely awesome so i'm gonna throw on the costume and do we, we took some rum. uh spider or some cider spiked with uh dark rum on our on our way <laughs> oh, so yeah well so, that's, that's really good i absolutely love that i'm gonna do something like that too tomorrow um all right well let's not linger too long because we have got to get into this injury section and make sure that we take care of this while we have time to do so so let's talk <laughs> about some of these dramatic week eight injuries if you did not see late in the game in the fourth quarter, Cooper Cup came up just a little bit lame on a catch, eventually had to walk it off to the sideline. We kind of heard some reports right before Sunday night football started that it looks like he's going to be okay. Hopefully it won't jeopardize uh, the, his status for the Rams. I believe they play the Bucks next week. So we're hoping he'll be good to go, but we'll wait and see throughout the week. And that concludes the injury section of the show. Thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Dramatically different from last week. You are for sure right about that. Yeah, it's it's nice to uh, be able to get through this injury section really easy. But, the, but with that said, like uh, this entire week beforehand was just filled with injuries the whole time. So yeah. I guess, you know, we got it all out of the way. A little bit easier to adjust to but that's all right man just like touchdowns we're gonna have injury regression to and from the mean as well but we look like at least right now we got a light week coming up uh which is awesome because not only do we have some really interesting topics for our three top performers and three uh under performers for the week there's a lot of good stuff to talk about in the notes section as well so i'm glad we're gonna have some time to dive into this uh let's start first and foremost with tony pollard 14 carries, 131 yards, three, one, two, three touchdowns. Also catches a pass in there for 16 yards as well. It was an outstanding game. Looked great, looked explosive. I found myself watching what I was seeing of that game on the Red Zone Network and just wondering, like, why the hell they ever give Zeke the ball? Can you explain to me? Like, it can't all just be contractual, but Pollard looked so good today so efficient like what what were your biggest takeaways from this explosion of a game from him yeah pollard is that one dude where you know you uh you can always say with all these like backup running backs that their efficiency is not going to last if they get a full workload well every time that tony pollard has gotten a full workload he's been really efficient really good i believe now every time that zeke has not played and tony pollard has started he's been the rb1 on the week <laughs> like and if this you know basically like he's not going to this week i don't believe um so I think they might go to Derrick Henry. But basically, you know, Tony, yeah. Tony Pollard just absolutely shows out whenever he gets the opportunity. Uh, I don't understand why Zeke continues to get the workload that he does. He seems to be inferior to Tony Pollard in almost every way. The only place he's really, like, definitively better is in pass protection. Um, so it makes sense that he still gets some snaps there. But I think it was, like, <laughs> after the game, they asked Jerry Jones, what's this going to mean? And he still goes, oh, when Zeke's back, yeah, we go with Zeke. Great. I don't know. You can't, you can't. Uh. So I guess here's, like, the big question, right? Like, is there any world in which I don't try and sell Tony Pollard this week? Yeah, I think there is a world that you don't because 
there's at least the chance that the Cowboys realize that they should just be giving the ball to Pollard uh, in a three down roll, you know, like this. There's the fact that he's still productive week in and week out, even if it's not this productive. Could I sell you on the idea that this is by far the highest his value will get at any point? And if I can capitalize now, I'm, that's good. I'm not sure his value is like necessarily that high just because I think most people know that Ezekiel Elliott continues to be the, the guy when they're both healthy. Um, if you can trade Tony Pollard for, I don't know, like a top eight running back or something like that. Sure. Like, absolutely. I'm just afraid that like, that's not even going to happen. Any targets in the, maybe the back end of that RB one territory where you feel like if you were sitting on that particular player and someone came and offered you Tony Pollard, you'd have to really think about it. Running back for running back swaps. I think Um, are really interesting. Yeah. I would say like, if I was the Tony Pollard manager, maybe I'm sending it for like Deandre Swift, who has dealt with injuries. Um, but I, who I would I would want DeAndre Swift season long. Same personally. What about because I almost approached you earlier, man, and wanted to like make the case for putting Michael Pittman back into the underperformer section. And my justification for doing that was because he, I can't come off of him. Like I know he's going to underperform, but like today I looked at Michael Pittman and some teams where I had like Rondell Moore and Zay Jones and like couldn't make the move to get Rondell Moore in over Michael Pittman. And I probably should have, but at the end of the day, like he was just good enough that we're not putting him into like the worst three performance of the week. It's just not what I expected from him. If, if I wanted to take that guy, cause you could take Michael Pittman and swap that name with a bunch of other wide receivers. You could put Deontay Johnson in that category. You could put Allen Robinson in that category. Like there's a whole bunch of guys from that same area, maybe even Marquise Brown, who is injured right now, or Mike Williams, who is injured right now. If, if I was going to try and package together someone like a Michael Pittman, who, you know, isn't doing well, but you know what his potential is with Pollard to go like two for one. Do you feel like there could be some deals potentially to be had there from a redraft perspective that you would be into? Like, I'm sure I'm not going to get Justin Jefferson or Cupper digs off of you. If I come to you with Pittman no. and Pollard, but like, what about like, look, look at T Higgins as a good example. Like maybe let's use that as a barometer. Jamar well, chase T- is out for a while. I see T Higgins is probably difficult to attain because of Jamar chase be- being out that, you know, we're expecting T Higgins to be the guy for Cincinnati. Hmm. If that were I mean, you, though, I don't know. you hadn't seen it yet, and I came knocking on the door and I said, hey, Wyatt, you got T. Higgins. I'd like to get him right now while Jamar Chase is out. Let me give you a slightly used Michael Pittman and a booming Tony Pollard. Yeah, I'm, Would I'm you have to no do a double quickly. take? That's yeah, rough. The market is just still not there. I mean, you wouldn't expect the market to be that way for someone who is like coming on a, thir- like a 25, 30-point game like Pollard is. But, I mean, you're right, man. I guess maybe if you have people in your league – who maybe th- don't realize the dynamics the way the quote unquote sharps would, you could find some ground there for movement, but otherwise I, I, I think, you're holding. I think that situation is just one that everybody knows what it is. Yeah. Unless we see something different with Zeke healthy, we all know the way this goes. Let's, I guess, talk about someone else who falls in a, in a similar category in my mind, just because with Christian McCaffrey, no longer a part of the Carolina Panthers, uh, Deontay Foreman seems to have about the same utility that Tony Pollard could have for the rest of the year. Another good week from Foreman, 26 carries, which is extremely good volume, 113 yards, three touchdowns, their commitment to continue to give him red zone touches. Even when sometimes he didn't score on the first one and they went back to him again, was really, really impressive. Um, Carolina by all means, like won that game before they handed it away. But for fantasy purposes, I think we care more about, are they competitive enough that Foreman's not going to get game scripted out? Well, so far in two opportunities, that answer has been yes. So how interested are you in potentially buying Deontay Foreman going forward the rest of the year? How matchup proof is he in your mind after seeing him for two games? Like these are the, I think the most relevant questions with him. I wanted Deont- Dante Foreman on my team as the moment CMC was traded because I think he's the better back compared to Chuba Hubbard to begin with. Yeah. Um, I was a little bit surprised that Chuba Hubbard kind of was playing ahead of Dante Foreman prior to his injury. But I think he's probably not going to be attainable after this game. 
Now, maybe he is once Chuba Hubbard is looking like he's going to be healthy and coming back. Um, I would say that it makes sense that Dante Foreman continues to play over Chuba once he's back. Like, I think it's pretty clear that he's the better running back. But I don't think this is the right time to get Dante Foreman. It, yeah, it I, was when CMC was traded. You know, pe I, people were going out trying to get one or the other, basically. I was always on the go get Dante if you can. Yeah, same. Um, but I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think if you don't, like, sure, if you're listening to this and you don't have Foreman and you could really use a running back, like, check on the price. You may run into people in your league. I am one of these people where I'm like always really happy if I just pick somebody up off the waiver wire a week or two ago and someone wants to trade them for anything of value. Like it always gets my attention. The mm -hmm. person who owns Foreman might be that person in your league. It's worth checking yeah. the price on, but in all likelihood, the price tag is far past what you'd be willing to pay for it. I think it's just if you got him from the wire, like you did what you were supposed to do, and now you get to reap the benefits. Um, but great game, man. Great game out of Pollard. Great game out of Foreman. I have one team where I play both. That's a hell of a way to do zero RB. <laughs> Feels great. I'm going to win on yeah. that one. Um, on that particular team, part of the reason why that team's going to win is because my quarterback wide receiver combo is Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown. And it looks like by the <laughs> first half of the 1 o'clock games that that week was over and I was winning yeah. that game. So let's talk about A.J. Brown, who we have now had come up a bunch of times when you and I have done this show together, especially in reference to what Devontae Smith and Goddard are getting. Today for A.J. Brown, it's 11 targets, six catches, 156 and three touchdowns. All three of those touchdowns come in what feels like a 15 minute span of the first half where he was yeah. just unstoppable over and over and over, including what was really close to a fourth. If you didn't have a chance oh, yeah. to see that game, Jul so Julius he, tackle. Yeah, he almost had four in the first half for what would have just been just absolutely incredible. But I think we're seeing. What we, I mean, at the beginning of the year, right? Like we saw a couple of good games out of AJ Brown and you and I had that discussion that like Devonte Smith looks dead and it looks like AJ Brown is going to be even a step better than we thought we would have. Uh, now it's like in a whole nother world. So what, yeah. like, what were your biggest takeaways from this performance today? Well, one, since like week one, we've learned that that offense is just so good. Like two yeah. out of the three are always going to be good. And sometimes it's all three. Um, AJ Brown is that dude. We kind of always knew that. We knew he was uber talented. It was no surprise there. It was just, is he going to fit into the offense? What's the offense going to do? What's Jalen Hurts? Jalen Hurts going to do? Jalen Hurts has impressed me so much as a passer this year. His development between year two and year three has been astonishing. The ball placement he had on those touchdowns was incredible. Uh, both of them were basically yeah. like AJ Brown's going up the side, like the the. Uh, uh, two of them were on like the right side of the field going up the sideline. They're on his sideline shoulder right over top where the defenders can't get to it. Like you literally can't defend the ball. It's so good. And that's what's really I'm noticing is that Jalen Hurts has put it all together. He's become a very good passer. This team, I'm they have to be Super Bowl favorites by a pretty large margin at this point. I feel like maybe... Uh, maybe the bills given them uh, the biggest run for their money, but like the man, the, 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 the Eagles just incredible right now. They, they are incredible. And I have a, some more to say about this topic and about AJ Brown, but we got to at least recognize here. It is the Devin Singletary show <laughs> at the moment. The bills offense is Devin Singletary just churning. This is now a 30 yard carry for Devin Singletary. He just went nine, five and 30 on three straight runs. Good Lord. That's a good, good whole good run. Uh, we're not going to have a chance. I mean, I don't know if Devin Singletary has it in him to make it into our top performers category at any <laughs> point. He's just not that kind of player, but man, real reliable year from Devin Singletary. Nothing but good things to say about having him as like your RB two and teams where you did not prioritize running back. Um, but as much as I want to digress into talking about the bills uh, for me, I think one thing in particular, why about AJ Brown is, I want this to be like a mantra. Like I want to tattoo it to my forehead. I want to write it on all of my notes. I want to remember for next year that like, this is just wide receivers and talent. And like, I've seen that with Cooper cup and I've seen it with Justin Jefferson. And now this year I'm seeing it with, with AJ Brown. Like, I don't think Kirk cousins is that good of a quarterback. 
Like I agree with you about Jalen Hurts and his progression, but I still don't think Jalen Hurts is that good of a throwing quarterback. And I sure as hell know that like Jalen Rager and Nelson Aguilar and Quez Watkins and God love him, Devontae Smith are not making these catches. Yeah, like a lot of what true. I'm seeing, I think, especially Devonta Smith, of, maybe, but yeah. of both of them, I think both of them having the success is a correlation of them being together and i want to remember because you know it's going to happen like it's more common this day to see trades than anything else it's going to happen as the lead into next year when we're getting ready for redraft season there's going to be some huge name that moves teams and i'm going to have to remember to think about aj brown and not Devonte adams even though Devonte adams has had a pretty good year like man the talent wins out especially like the young talent like this it's just good good on you everybody yeah. who got aj brown especially those of you who did it in like the third round well done victory lap that one halfway through this we, we talk sure. about it like all the time where it's just like you want to have players that are really talented on your team and then you start like dissecting all the different situations and you start to nitpick here and there but like at the end of the day you have to just give some credence to players who are just super talented and don't knock them too far down your rankings because you're unsure about the situation. The best players in the world make the situations work for them. Yeah, they do. Mike Evans, T Higgins, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, four guys. I distinctly remember having right in front of AJ Brown in my preseason redraft rankings that lighted on fire. Start, and that's not even that start bad. over we necessarily wrong. Like those were still players to have high. It's just that like AJ Brown is, you know, one of the best wide receivers in the NFL period, like full stop. Right. You just got to, you know, put he belonged. He belonged in that Stefan Diggs and Devonte Adams territory, which at, even though Devonte Adams is in that territory, that's a great segue to our underperformers <laughs> for the week. Yeah. Not um, this week. <laughs> so yeah, let's, let's take a look at that. Cause I, I, like I said, like, I don't think Kirk Cousins is that great of a quarterback, but sh he sure does make Justin Jefferson look good and vice versa. Jalen Hurts is a totally different type of animal. I kind of was hoping that Devontae Adams would do that for Derek Carr, but wholly not seeing that to start the year. Uh, I guess I can't even say to start the year. We're like halfway through the year at this point, which is crazy. Today is a whole nother level of ineptitude. Not only was it a bad fantasy day for Carr and for Adams, Carr goes for like these these numbers can't be right. It's correct. He didn't, and he 20, didn't play the whole game. That's 26 yards. In an interception, okay, Devontae. 26. Oh, the, you, you mean 126? 15, 15 of 26, 101 <laughs> yards. Oh, like, there's no way it was 26 One interception. Yards, but that's still absolutely terrible. Devontae yeah. Adams with a really, really disappointing day as well. Um, that's just one catch for three yards. He was negative for like a good portion of the day, too, which was gross. But it's not just that they did bad, dude. Like they went on the road to the Saints and got shut out. Yeah. So sure, Devontae Adams had a bad day. Derek Carr had a bad day. I'm curious in particular what you think made Devontae Adams have a bad day. But I'm also curious about the Raiders as a whole from you, because this is like affecting everyone. Like Waller's not playing. When Waller doesn't play, which is like half the games, I want Devontae Adams and like DFS lineups and all kinds of other places. I want to find ways to get like Renfro and Mac Collins in my teams because I assume they're going to pick up the slack, but like Devonte Adams is just the figurehead for everything being terrible for the Raiders offense. What say you? I really don't know what happened here. Like they, they were never on red zone because they were never like in remotely close to scoring. So I don't know what happened exactly because I didn't get to see any of it, but like, I have to assume that the saints just went to this game who with, without Marshawn Lattimore too, uh, Jeff yeah. said, like, we're going to guard Devontae Adams, and if the rest of your team can beat us, okay. But, I mean, the Saints have a good defense. They have a good pass rush. They play well against the run. Like, it wouldn't, like, I'm, I have to assume that they basically just, like, put it on, like, you have to beat us with Matt Collins and Foster Moreau. <laughs> you know, like, good luck. And, and it didn't uh, work. It didn't, didn't work, work that way. But I... We're not going to be swayed off of Devontae Adams going into future matchups. Like he's no. just not that kind of player. Derek Carr isn't even on the radar of streaming quarterbacks, at least for me at this point. So I guess we just hope to see some better, more healthy results as well. Uh, who's that little scramble drill going to one yard, one yard knocks touchdown, some tight end love here. 
on Halloween Eve as the Bills take a 7-0 lead to get this game going. Um, all right, a couple running backs to talk about. So we talked about Pollard and Foreman and how great that felt. We're going to talk about a couple of other guys that I played on some teams that didn't go so well. First and foremost, Daryl Henderson. <clears throat> what I, what was it, like four or five points total? I mean, 16 yards on the ground, caught two balls for 14. So in half PPR, that is... 2.4 it's four points it's awful yeah i i think more awful in terms of the fact that he looks like an attractive play because acres isn't around malcolm brown is dust kieran williams is not playing and matthew barry's tweeting about some guy named ronnie rivers <laughs> on saturday night that no one has ever heard of except for six of you who are are not me None of those guys are enthusiastic. And we've seen Daryl Henderson perform well in this situation, but he's had a lot of opportunity this year for it to not go as well as it to, for it to go as bad as it's gone, I guess is the right way to say it. Is, is he dead, dead? Like, am I going to get better results from him in the future or what? <sighs> what? <laughs> like, I don't like the Rams seem to not want to have to rely on Daryl Henderson for just for whatever reason. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like they've only ever really gone to him when they've had to now he's performed when they've had to go to him, but they don't seem to want to rely on him for whatever reason. I mean, he is small and somewhat injury prone, um, but still like clearly the most talented running back on the roster. They've had trouble running just in general, but that's because the offensive line has been so bad. Like I, they, so they, I, the rumblings came out that Ronnie Rivers was a thing. And then, like, right before game time, there were reports that Ronnie Rivers, like, for the pregame warm-ups, took the first snap at running back. And that was, like, the, uh-oh, turns out Daryl Henderson's not starting this game. It's not like Ronnie Rivers did anything with his day. He had eight carries for 21 yards, uh, four targets, four catches, 15 yards. Mm -hmm. Like, I... Really, this is just, unless your name's Cooper Cup, you really just can't be started from this offense. Nobody. I mean, Higby was looking okay for a little while uh, in PPR leagues. He could be your safe floor tight end for like eight to nine points a week. We didn't get anything remotely close to that this week. Mm -hmm. like, so the team's just broken. Like, and he was hobbled a little bit. He did have like a little... yeah. It's teeny true. dust up at the beginning of the game who knows how that affected but like van jefferson got activated today and was irrelevant yeah that just makes me like even more concerned about if i have to play alan robinson now that there's just another person to muck all this up um i thought it was interesting that rivers finished with exactly double the amount of opportunity that daryl henderson had like that's not good for the future do you do you think we'll go bonus topic on the rams if the trade deadline comes and goes and acres is still on the team, do you think that they try and reconcile this and that they give acres an opportunity to come back and prove that he should be the guy? Uh, I doubt it. I think acres even asked like just to be straight up released if he doesn't get traded. So I don't think acres is going to be on this team for very much longer. Um, and maybe Ronnie rivers is bad enough that Daryl Henderson regains the starting role, but like, we're still not pumped about it. Yeah, not at all. But that's all right, because I'm hoping that most of you are not really committed to Daryl Henderson or Cam Akers on your team and that Ronnie Rivers is not a guy you picked up hoping that you would be playing him all the time. Ooh, close on the flea flicker, but that ain't going to get it done, Rogers. Nice try. Uh, you are, however, committed to playing Jonathan Taylor, and it doesn't matter what the matchup is or how many points he had last week or if he was limited in practice. Like, if Jonathan Taylor is active, you're playing him every week. And since week one, that has been for 7.6 half PPR points a game, which is pretty terrible. This week, it was nothing through the air. 76 on the ground in a game where, God, I wish I could remember, but in a game where Sam Elliger, Heineke are your quarterbacks, and never at any point was a team up by maybe more than 10. Like, I don't even know if a team was up by 10. No, in fact, the, in the fourth quarter... Indianapolis was leading 16 to seven with 11 minutes to go nine. That's right. So that's the bet. The game script is favorable. 
Yes. For Jonathan Taylor. It was at worst a three point <sighs> game for the Colts at any point or a four point game. I'm sorry that they were down. And then they going into the, the fourth quarter, they, they basically scored the fourth quarter, beginning of the fourth quarter to take the lead. They, yeah. they stretched the lead. And this is what, you know, Taylor gets in a, in a great game stretch for them. All right. So not only is it just the 76 yards, but he also had not a great fumble towards the end of that game to just really put some salt in the wounds. Let's let's start with the obvious. Are you in agreement with my earlier assessment? You're never thinking about taking Jonathan Taylor out of your team if you took him in the first or second pick. Like you're not there, right? I I couldn't sit him. Okay, either could I. I don't have it in me. So we're assuming that we have him. You, and you'd have to have like to an absurd him. roster right now yeah. where it's like uh, you are like you went robust running back. <laughs> like you know you know you hit on both the like two more. And then you also gained like Tony Pollard and maybe Zeke doesn't come back. And it's like, okay, yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> but not, not likely. So yeah. how much then, if you're looking forward down the road, I have Jonathan Taylor. I'm frustrated. Maybe I want to trade him and get out from under him. Cause he's just killing me. How much of this do you think was because it was Ellinger's first game? I don't think it has much to do with Ellinger. Because he was not bad. He was 17 of 23, 201 yards. He averaged 8.7 yards per uh, attempt. Like, he, he was good. Um, but are we didn't... sure that that's not because Washington was just like, all right, you do you, but not Jonathan Taylor? I mean, it's it's possible. But you're Jonathan Taylor. <laughs> um, I Honestly, I, think, I don't think this offensive line is as good as it was last year. Yeah, and it, for sure it's not. I mean, they... I, Matt Ryan didn't do himself a ton of favors, but they were a lot of the reason that he is probably now retired. And like, we've only seen a couple times where they actually target, like use him in the, in the uh, passing game. Like one target Mm -hmm. is not enough. Even with Sam Ellinger only throwing it 23 times, like that's not okay. He's the, he's the best player on your roster, basically, like at least on offense. That's a problem that 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 is an ongoing thing for Jonathan Taylor. He's not involved in the passing game enough. It feels like we're talking about Nick Chubb. Yeah, except this has been uh, the issue, not this year, but this has been the issue. It feels like that's the conversation that we're having. Like everyone knows that this is what you should do, except for the people making the decisions. Yeah. And here's the result that we're suffering from because of it. You trying to get rid of him? You, you, you've always kind of been the guy. We'll set the tone for everyone who. You've always been reluctant to trade players when you're trading players for less than what you think they're worth. And the value on Jonathan Taylor in the market is probably a lot lower than you're comfortable with. So are you yeah. still holding him and showing patience? It obviously depends on what is actually available to me within a trade. But yeah, most uh, my assumption is that I wouldn't be able to gain anything that I think is worth trading away Jonathan Taylor for. Like I would still need top eight running back probably you know something or or wide receiver something like that for me to want to move Jonathan Taylor otherwise it's not worth it worth it to me I mean what if this offense puts it together with Sam Ellinger and Jonathan Taylor is back to his old ways and he's you know going for 20 a game again I mean it's possible and you gave up on it you never want to be that guy oh well who knows? Maybe these are potential trade targets. If you do feel like you do not want to hold Jonathan Taylor, let's go quick hitter through some of my favorite weekly notes. We're going to start. I would with... trade. I would trade Tony Pollard for Jonathan Taylor. See if you can get that done. Yeah, right. Well, sure. Why not offer it? But hey, yeah. I'd take it in a second. Um, let's go quick hitter. Let's do three running backs. Tell me which one you want to talk about. Travis Etienne is the bell cow running back. We all hoped he would be. It just took a little while to get there. Derrick Henry remains not only the king, but the entirety of the Titans offense. What did Malik Willis throw like 10 passes today? Well, Derrick Henry was running for 220 yards and two touchdowns. It was crazy. And my, my personal favorite, Christian McCaffrey heads out to the bay, throws a touchdown, catches a touchdown, rushes a touchdown. It is the holy trifecta for Christian McCaffrey. That's three really good performances. Which one do you want to talk about? I'll, I'll leave CMC for you. The Henry one, I don't think it's super exciting because the it Texans just is what have he the, is. the worst run defense in the NFL. ETN, baby. But Travis ETN. Now, I, I did when James Robinson was traded away, I said on Twitter, like, this doesn't actually mean anything for Travis ETN because he had already taken over the backfield. It was pretty yeah, clear that he already for had. For sure. Uh, 
but it's man, is it is it great to just see him continue to do it? Um, Etn part of the concern for him coming in was like, would he be used like a bell cow? Like, was that in his range of outcomes? Could he do that? And here he is. The Jags just committed to him fully. Twenty four carries, three targets, like twenty seven opportunities is huge. And he, yeah, massive against the Broncos, who were one of the best defenses in the league. He was chewing them up like they were nothing. He he's a very exciting player to watch because he has like elite burst and speed at the running back position. And he just like he hits the hole so hard and he's gone. It's every week he has a 40 yard play every week. It's insane how he's able to do it with such consistency. Love to see it. He's I, I, at least top 10 art running back rest of season. I would definitely rather have tra- Travis Etienne than Jonathan Taylor uh, like. I know he might even be top five, like nearing that. Um, if he's going to get fed like this every week, he's going to be top five. I agree very, very much so. I, I was really impressed today with his vision as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's the, I don't know, like, I don't know my holes and gaps for offensive lines and run plays well enough to describe it, but there. There's a particular play that when running backs can make it, I'm always very impressed by it. Saquon is always really good at it, where the end of the offensive line will kind of push out. So they're not running directly up the middle, but that's also not an end around. And there's like a moment of kind of as you're heading towards the side, towards the last offensive lineman, there's some vision and decision making involved with the running backs where you they kind of either have to go more towards the sideline or cut it upfield. And yeah. Barkley like always seems to make the so decision zone on those blocking outside the... plays. Yeah. Where the offensive right. line's all moving to the side and they're kind yeah. of blocking the people in front of them and they the running back finds the hole to hit. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they cut up and just cut downfield. And Bark Barkley's great at that. Like he's always good at getting past like the first three guys in the offensive line and kind of knowing where to go and finding the yardage that's there. And ETN was reminding me a whole lot of like good Saquon today, watching him run the ball and go through what is like a pretty good pretty good run stopping game for the Broncos. I don't know where they rate in the league, but like they have good personnel to stop the run. Like that is not an easy matchup to just run on. And he did great. So I I expect really good things for ETN the rest of the year. I, I with you, man, I think I'd go after him with like pretty much anything that I could. Like if I drafted Kamara in the second or third round, depending when my draft was, I'd probably flip Kamara for ETN in a second. And there's a good chance that that deal goes through. Christian Watson's out. Start the show <laughs> over. This is a horrible night. <laughs> I did. I, I, I did see the injury. I'm not surprised by that. Um, not much to say for CMC, man. So I, it just is what it is. It's just nice. You never, you never know. Like you took a guy in the first round. He goes to a new team. You're like, oh, you got the anxiety. Oh, it was so good. Um, I'll say this, I guess, since I don't have like a, no one's going to have a big CMC take. Like you got him. You're going to play him. Wow. Um, Debo not playing today and CMC yeah. having the game that he had. And I'm sure because you were watching Red Zone, you got to see a lot of that game too. Uh, with the, the presence of CMC for balancing that offense and what it did for guys like Ayuk, who saw mm-hmm. like space that Ayuk has not seen. I mean, like, let's be honest. Like, I, we haven't seen Ayuk have that much open space to catch the ball by the line and like do what he wants to. And sure as hell like no one's going to convince me that cmc's presence is not part of the reason that all the other pieces of that offense looked really good i cannot wait i hope that debo comes back because if he does i cannot wait to see them play again next week and see like what the ceiling is for this offense but we we could be careening towards an extremely good 49ers eagles playoff matchup and that's sure as hell what i'm hoping for there Um, was some concern for cmc though after that trade, there were people, I mean, like, yeah, I basically said that even like, I'm not sure he'll get the same target volume that he was yeah, getting he in Carolina, right. but without a doubt, he has more touchdown equity with the 49ers. Sure. But that's natural. I mean, like you're the only player of any relevance in Carolina. Yeah. So of course, like going to a team where there's going to be other mouths to feed, like is a little bit nerve wracking. So it's nice to see it went the way it did. Um, Let's talk about some receiver days. Elijah Moore is oh, just dead and buried. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins, unbelievable since coming back from the suspension. The Hill and Waddle show continues. Terry McLaurin looking a lot better with Heineke than he did with Wentz. 
And DK Metcalf, I thought his leg, ankle, and everything in between was broken, and he came back and was just disgustingly good this week. <laughs> so Elijah Moore, DeAndre Hopkins, Miami receivers, Terry McLaurin, and DK Metcalf. Pick one of those five while we're watching. I mean, it could only be Diggs that could make that catch. Diggs is going to be in this segment if we were doing it later. That's a hell of a touchdown. Uh, which one do you want to talk about? DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah, go for it. That's your dude. Who... Yeah, um, came back at the exact right time after Marquise Brown went down. Now he has 27 targets the last two weeks, 22 catches, 262 yards, and a touchdown. And I think he's helped um, Kyler Murray out a lot here because while Marquise Brown is great and he's been good, uh, Marquise Brown does not have the hands like DeAndre Hopkins has. Like DeAndre Hopkins can make a play on a ball at any point and can be relied upon to just move the chains when they need to. And Marquise Brown is not that kind of guy. So I think it's really improved the offense too. And Kyler Murray, I mean, had that connection with him beforehand. I mean, DeAndre Hopkins is definitely at least top 10 wide receiver at this point um, since coming back, which there was some concern that he wouldn't be that much when he came back last year. He did have his target volume kind of go down a little bit. He really just relied on touchdowns last year. So there was some some concern this year that uh, what would he be when he came back? Now, maybe it's just because Marquise Brown is out that DeAndre Hopkins getting absolutely fed. But, well, Marquise Brown is going to be out for a little while longer. Basically, all of the fantasy regular season. So, I mean, I don't know if you can actually get DeAndre Hopkins for a worthwhile cost, but... I am really happy to see Hopkins showing out. I have Hopkins in a lot of places, Mm -hmm. so I'm loving it. Uh, It's awesome. It's nice to see him playing that well because, you know, there was the school of thought that he was kind of old and Mm -hmm. the PEDs might have had something to do with it. He could be, could be dust, but clearly, clearly not. And that's nice to see. Um, That was a 26 yard, beautiful catch and throw on that Diggs touchdown, by the way. So hell of a start for the bills here like everything's working which is is no surprise uh yeah. this is the biggest underdog aaron Rodgers has ever been in a game coming into buffalo tonight so and it probably wasn't enough points enjoy it while you can spread. kids especially you older kids that are our age or older because you never know when the run's gonna end you didn't think it was the last year for Philip Rivers, and then it was and you didn't think Matt Ryan was gonna stop playing football in the middle of the year but he has <laughs> Go and enjoy your Rodgers and Brady while you can, because this is probably the end of that train. Um, For me, I'll give one last throw in. It's Hill and Waddle. It's wild, dude. Was it Hill goes for 188? Waddle has 106, but Waddle catches the two touchdowns. So he's got a huge amount of points with the two touchdowns added to his 106. Uh, There were 23 targets between the two of them, which is wild. And this kind of harkens back to the same line of thinking with A.J. Brown when we talked about A.J. Brown earlier and how talent should win out. I don't know how much of that game you got to watch. Tua allowed Tyreek Hill to have a great game on garbage passes. A lot of them were terrible. Like, there were plays where yeah. Tyreek Hill is wide open for touchdowns. And because he's Tyreek Hill, like, not only does – it's not like he had to break stride and slow down. Like, why there were a couple of balls where Tyreek Hill had to, like, kind of stop yeah. and it was less than a jog like I don't even know what to say like he had to power walk for five yards and then turn to the left real quick to catch this underthrown ball before the DBs like knew what was going to happen and that happened multiple times throughout the game and like that's nothing new we knew coming into the season that Tua's ability to support wide receivers was in question and we didn't know how his arm strike was going to come into play with Tyreek but like the talent and speed of Tyreek is making it work anyway and he's keeping defenses so honest that Waddle, as talented as he is, is able to get his. And both of these guys are just fucking exceptional. And it's awesome watching the Dolphins offense play when it is in full steam like it was today. Granted, it was against the Lions, but still like hell of a game to watch from the two of them. It's super, super exciting football. And because we're halfway through this year, I'm already starting to keep an eye on what things are going to look like next year. Like, Hill and Waddle were not in the conversation as guys that I would be taking in the late first, early second. Like, 
I -hmm. wasn't getting, and I have none, and this is my fault. Like, I have no shares of Tyree Kill because I wasn't willing to pay a second round price tag on him. So I was never getting him because by the time I was ready to take him in the third, he was already gone. And Waddle, I had even a couple rounds behind that. So I don't have that many shares of Waddle other than like one or two places out of what could be like 20 teams. Like, got to remember, man, like the talent was there. The situation was suspect. And because of that, I forced myself to miss out on some really good talent. Yeah. Credit to, or, you know, a little bit to Tua, uh, Tar Hill does that to every quarterback he plays with. That's true. <laughs> that's fairness. true. Like, it's, he's like, that that's fast. happened with Mahomes yeah. before. Um, but yeah, I mean, to it, yeah, he doesn't have the absolute strongest arm, so that's going to happen sometimes. Both of these guys were wide receiver ones and half PPR points per game coming into the week. That's obviously going to stay. They're actually both uh, top 10 if you remove DeAndre Hopkins and Michael Thomas from that half PPR points per game. Um, Tyreek Hill is on pace to set the NFL rec- receiving yards record for a season. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm. My only concern with I luckily I was still in on Tyreek Hill. I got a lot of Tyreek Hill. I have no Waddle, like no Waddle whatsoever. Because my thought was, I I think Tyreek Hill is the wide receiver one for the team, and I just don't know they're going to pass enough to support both of them. Well, they're passing enough. In fact, sure that's all they basically wrong do. about that. Yeah. <laughs> Granted, at the time, like we thought Chase Edmonds was going to be something that he wasn't, but like yeah. we should have known. And and I'm starting to see like this pattern develop across a lot of the things well, that I thought well, part I thought of it earlier is in the season. New coach Mike McDaniel's. We don't know what he's going to be like on his own. Well, now we know that Mike McDaniel's is really that brilliant and uh, plays to his players' strengths perfectly. But we didn't know that that was the way it was going to be with mm-hmm. him coming over, especially just, coming from the North, from the 49ers, who had been traditionally a run heavy offense. We didn't know, you know, what he was going to do. Right. It's just, it's one of those things that I want to be like conscious of and try and remember it as I go forward. Cause when it comes to AJ Brown and Tyree kill and Jalen Waddle, like the conversation that I was having about those guys during draft season wasn't about those guys. It was about their quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. And like, that's a mistake on my part that I don't want to make anymore. Like I got to remember that we're talking about like, you know, situation matters, but there's a degree well, of talent at the to top it, right? of the draft that like the talent of these particular players so far exceeds the matter like how much the situation matters that we gotta remember we account for the situation too much and too too many times it's only in the absolute worst of situations where it actually really hurts a player like we've seen it hurt dj more even though that's actually improved now with pj walker somehow but like when baker mayfield was the quarterback he was the worst of the worst and it was seriously hurting dj (laughs) more right but like just average QBs can support these absolutely talented players because those players are so be- so good they lift people with them. Well, we're going to have a lot of time to dissect all this before we get to draft season next year, but for now I guess we'll uh we'll give it another hopefully injury-free week. We will see all of you back here for week nine of the good, the bad, and the box score uh, next Sunday evening. Hopefully you got a chance to check this out Monday morning. If you do, happy Halloween to you. Have a wonderful spooky season and a wonderful spooky day. Again, I am Will underscore FF. He is Wyatt B underscore FF. You can find all of us, all the guys at JWB underscore FF or JWB Fantasy Football on Twitter. Ton of shows throughout the week. The uh, Crushing the Competition show, Square Scare and Prayer. Who you got coming up for Dynasty Digest this week? This week we have our good friend Matt Chester. You can find on Twitter nice. at Mad Chester. That's awesome. Good for Jester. That's my Coney. Shout out to the Coney, baby. Not getting it done this week. Losing to you, but that's okay. Sometimes it'd be like that. As long as you wins. Trying to all. return. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you got a good shot to do that. But hey, I mean that. As long as JWB wins, we all win. And if you're listening to JWB, you're a winner yourself. So have a hell of a week. We will see y'all soon. <laughs>